Hey guys, it is Tyler here back once again with another Assassin's Creed Valhalla video. Today we're going to be talking about my top 10 predictions for the game. So that includes story, gameplay, theories of what's to come, potential endings, things like that. Now this isn't ordered in my top 10 what's most likely going to happen from 10 to 1 sort of thing. It's more 10 to 1 in the predictions I hope happen. The predictions I'm most excited about happening in that sense. That's how I've sort of ordered it. But I would say these predictions range from mm, probably unlikely and won't happen. Or if it does, it'll be in a completely different way than maybe I want it to. To ones that are a bit more obvious and in your face. But we'll have to wait till the game comes out, of course, to find out. And it's only a matter of weeks away at this point. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Coming in at number 10 is that Eivor kills Sigurd. Now Sigurd of course is the brother of Eivor or adopted brother of Eivor that we've seen throughout some of the demos and gameplay trailers and things of that nature. And it's become pretty obvious based on the fact that at the beginning of the game the Foreseer in Norway tells Eivor that he will betray, he or she of course, will betray their brother Sigurd. So that's a part of the prophecy, that's something that is to come, that we already sort of know, so it's not necessarily a massive prediction that we're going to kill him, right? I mean, betraying doesn't necessarily mean kill, but I think that's pretty obvious. We've heard from Darby McDevitt, the narrative director, that there's a darker side to Sigurd. I've been saying for many previous videos, since Sigurd was revealed as a character, that Eivor is definitely going to be killing him. That's just what's going to happen, that tornness between that Viking, maybe assassin sort of side of things, or at least seeing what the value is, you know, Eivor wants to find a home for his people, Sigurd potentially wants to be a king of his own kingdom, and those two ideas don't quite align, and Sigurd potentially gets mad with power or takes things too far, we just don't know, but either way, at some point in this game, Eivor, I think is going to kill Sigurd. Number nine, this conquest map will have very little impact on the end game of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Now, the conquest map is where your clan starts to plot out what areas they want to sort of bring influence to. So when you're going to work your way through Wessex or East Anglia and Mercia and Northumbria, the four main kingdoms of England, you know that you're going to be involved in this sort of Game of Thrones battles of picking sides of who you want to help and who you want to be the ruler of that region and bringing your influence and your clan's influence into that region and that potentially has gameplay effects from being having certain allies in control of certain areas and potentially has impact on the end game. However, I don't actually believe this main part of the game will have a massive impact on the story. We know there's three major story arcs, which is, of course is the clan story arc, the hidden one story arc, and then Eivor's themselves. And when it comes to Eivor, I believe that's the central focus of the game, Eivor the character. So, whatever ending happens, at the end of the day, it's going to be the same ending for Eivor. And the things that will change, uh, those little decisions you make, will be sort of in the background of what impact you have on the main ending. But it's not going to be massive. I don't think it's going to matter which ruler you put in place in this small section of East Anglia. I just don't think it will. It might make a difference to certain parts at the end of the game, of what character shop to help you or fight you. But I don't think it'll have a massive story impact on what happens to Eivor as a character. I really think that's going to be set in stone. So I think those choices, again, will have a gameplay impact, but will not have a major story impact when it comes to the end of the game. At number eight, it's male, female, Eivor. And what's the story there? My prediction is, at the end of the day, the reason you can change between both, and there's an option for letting the Animus decide, is that Layla's Animus, as well as the staff of Hermes, are having an impact on creating simulations through the Animus, not necessarily reliving memories, but creating past events to see potential futures, just as the Isu have. I've been making Assassin's Creed theory and lore videos for many, many years, and going back to Assassin's Creed Origins, it set up certain plot lines of Layla's Animus being different, and Odyssey continued that by introducing the Staff of Hermes, and these talks of simulations through the Isu Elithia, who talked about 
the potential different simulations and the changes that the staff of Hermes can have and what humans can actually have an impact on. It's not just a power that the Isu have. And again, we saw that in Origins as well. So I believe that Layla's using not just her animus, but the staff of Hermes and potentially some other artifact that they've come into contact with the, the beginning of Valhalla or in between Odyssey and Valhalla to then impact what's going on in this simulation with Eivor and what's being created strongest, potentially of what outcome they want to have. Potentially, there's an idea of what outcome they want at the end of this storyline, but the player sort of guides their way through and has an impact on certain different things that can be changed, but it didn't really happen necessarily. It's just a simulation to see if those events happen, would we get to the con conclusion, excuse me, that we want to get to? I believe that's the reason that there's a male and a female Eivor. Number seven is quite an interesting one, I think, is that the end game of Valhalla is set before the ending. So what I mean by that is we've had an announcement of the post-game content, the DLC that takes place in Ireland and in Paris. Now, those are set 10 years after the main game's supposed to be, right? Or at least the one in Paris, the Siege of Paris specifically. Now, I believe all those events that take place in the clan storyline take place before the actual ending of the game that we will see in the main story. So what I mean by that is that any sort of sieges, any sort of battles, any sort of impact that Eivor has with his or her settlement or any of these conquests of different regions, any of these events and battles as being a Viking will happen before the main ending in terms of the chronological storyline of how things play out. So when we see the ending, which I believe will be an assassin ending and Eivor heading to the Middle East, and we'll talk about that in a second because that's definitely one of my predictions, is that Eivor will be an assassin at the end of the game. And based around that idea, Eivor will not be necessarily in England. Therefore, whatever happens in post-game, when you still get to run around and do your side quests, you still get to run around and do your DLCs and expansions and anything else that you might have missed throughout playing the game, that's all chronologically taking place before the ending scene that we will see at the end. That's what I mean by that. All of those events will chronologically take place before the ending scene. That ending scene we see will be the end, end, end of Eivor's story. And anything else we play took place before that. That's what I think. That's a big prediction of mine. At number six is we will see the Assassins and the Templars come into sort of formation and what I mean by that is of course that the assassins are known at this time period as the hidden ones and the Templars are known as the Order of the Ancients. We know that there's differences between them especially when it comes to the Order of the Ancients and that's something that will become clear in their belief system throughout Valhalla that's what we've been told. So what I think is going to happen throughout Valhalla and towards the ending of the game is we start to see hints in terms of what becomes of them both. Why in 1191 in the events of Assassin's Creed 1 the Assassins are called Assassins, and the Templars are called the Knights Templar. I think we're going to start to see that transition take place in Valhalla, that's what I think is going to happen. They'll go from Hidden Ones to Assassins, or to the Ancients to Templars, or at least hints of those seeds being planted in those differences being made. That's my prediction. And number five, Break the Code, Break the Node will return. Now, Break the Code, Break the Node comes from the empirical truth in Assassin's Creed Origins, which is, I've got a whole video on, again, you can go watch it, I explain all the different Isu messages that are left to Layla in that game. Now, of course, Bayek's running around in ancient Egypt and discovers these messages. Again, that didn't happen to Bayek. It's a part of Layla's animus and creating these simulations and events. One takes place underwater, for goodness sakes. There's no way Bayek could have sat there for 10 minutes listening to this underwater. It's just something that Layla's animus was able to find throughout that memory or throughout that region through the simulation of it all. And those messages are talking about a potential catastrophe that's happening and the fact that the catastrophe that was stopped in 2012 in Assassin's Creed 3 by Desmond is not stopped permanently. All it did was push it back. To be able to break the node, a node as in an event in time that can't be moved or changed, to break that, you've got to be able to break the code of time, which the Isu know how to do, but even them couldn't quite do it to the level they needed to because they failed to stop their global catastrophe so this is something Layla's Animus, the staff of Hermes, and potentially other artifacts, other characters need to be involved in, are going to try to do here to stop that global catastrophe. I think that storyline is going to be reintroduced. Odyssey gave in some extra tools with the staff of Hermes, but didn't do a whole lot in terms of addressing that break the code, break the node storyline. So I certainly believe that'll be brought back here in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and I think it'll be a big part of the modern day storyline and probably be even wrapped up in this modern day storyline of Valhalla. 
And number four is that the main storyline with Eivor will be a struggle between the Viking life and the assassin life. Now it's going to be a very slow transition. I've talked about this again in previous videos. A very Ghost of Tsushima-esque storyline where Jin struggles to be either a samurai or a ghost. It's going to be very different to that in terms of the, the pacing and how long it's going to take and how the struggle happens because I believe Eivor will be a very stern Viking for the majority portion of the first half of this game and only be introduced to elements of the Hidden Ones slash Assassins and how they behave and act and what they believe in. And there'll be certain events that take place involving, of course, Eivor's brother Sigurd that will start to push Eivor away from this lifestyle of a Viking and seek something greater, as well as seeing what the Order of the Ancients are doing and the influence they're having. And Eivor's going to struggle with witnessing the injustices of politics and being a ruler, being a king or a queen, that the Order of the Ancients are always in the background and lurking in the shadows of these political powers to try to influence potential futures that they see fit to their own belief system. Eivor's going to see that and be like, we've got bigger problems than just raiding villages here. And then that transition to helping the Hidden Ones out maybe more and more and that conflict between the Viking life's like, hey, why are you helping them? We need to be doing this. And there might be events missed and things happen and that Eivor needed to be there for but missed with his clan that potentially his clan's not going to want him around as much or there's people in his clan that are going to betray him because of that. And he's going to be more drawn towards the Hidden Ones and in the end become a hidden one, become an assassin, and have that influence. That's what I think the story struggle with Eivor as a character is going to be. Uh, plus, I'm sure much more than that, but that's a major plot point that I'm sternly predicting happens and hoping happens, because I think it would be a great idea. It would also make it so different to Black Flag, where Edward was a pirate from beginning to end, and all Edward really did when he became an assassin towards the end of the game was realise how wrong he was the whole time how arrogant he was when he found out the ideas and beliefs of the assassins he just sort of liked what they had to offer in terms of their skills he didn't give a shit about their creed and couldn't care less about their way of life and the influence they have on other people's lives whereas i think Eivor will be someone that knows straight away and sees very early of the impact they can have and is turned in a sort of more moderate pace throughout the whole game and by the end will be quite a strong believer in the system, not someone that's necessarily completely arrogant towards it, and then is turned around right at the end when he loses everything. Maybe it'll be similar, but I think it'll be different in that sense. At number three, we will go to the Grand Temple. Now, I don't know whether this will be in the modern day, I don't know whether this will be as Eivor, but I predict we will see the Grand Temple in Valhalla. Now what was introduced in one of the most recent trailers for Valhalla was that we traveled to North America and we saw some Native American villages and this is a big surprise to me. I really didn't expect this to be a location in the game and it just continues to push this idea of all these past Assassin's Creed locations being involved in Valhalla being this sort of round off moment where it's going to tie together a lot of loose ends that have just been sort of left hanging and that the narrative director, Darby McDevitt, he's seen all these loose threads that really had no ending plan. This wasn't a long-term plan or anything, but he's taken this opportunity to create a narrative that is going to wrap up a lot of loose ends for fans because it might be the last opportunity for this ever to happen. Because going forward, we're probably not going to have a game that necessarily cares about what's come before. It's just going to create its own game and its own life cycle as a game of service. So this is Darby's chance to create a lot of loose end narrative threads and tie them up so that's exciting and the fact that north america is a part of this game in any way there's got to be a reason for it it can't just be oh that's cool right well we know the grand temple is in northeastern united states and i just it's too much of a coincidence that there's all these previous locations that have been teased and that's one of them there's got to be a reason we go there we know there's an Isu temple in Norway. That's, we know that from Assassin's Creed 2, and Darby sort of used that, and he's going to try to tie that in. And to have the Grand Temple where it is, and then have that also be a s close location um, to where Vikings potentially travel to uh, in real history, not necessarily maybe that far down into um, North America, but it's Assassin's Creed. Let's push the limits a bit here with what history really happened. So I want to see what this leads to, did Eivor go to the Grand Temple before, is this simulation of Layla's Animus 
making us go back to the Grand Temple earlier so that we can somehow find information to undo what was done in 2012 where it wasn't too late. It gives us an extra thousand years before the catastrophe is going to happen to prepare. Is that something that's going to happen? Is that going to be why the Grand Temple comes into play here? I think we're going to see it nonetheless, no matter what we find from there. Even if it's maybe not as big of an impact that I think it will have, I think we're going to see the Grand Temple. Coming in at number two is that Desmond will become an important part of the modern day once again. And I don't mean he'll be in the game. I don't think he'll be in the game at all, not even his voice. I do think that Desmond will be an important part of the story in terms of what he did back in his arc of the modern day. Rebecca and Sean are supposed to be in the modern day of this game. So they're characters that were alongside him throughout his journey and saw what he did in 2012 in the Grand Temple that we were just talking about. And I think that the whole break the code, break the node, the whole catastrophe coming again and Desmond didn't actually stop it. What he did is going to then have an impact on what's going forward, where they're going to try to change it or see an alternative future or a way to break this node permanently and break the code of time. So his storyline and what he did is going to be really important to what they're doing here in Valhalla's modern day in terms of trying to undo it, in terms of doing it in a better and more correct way. And we know that throughout much of the modern day storyline, there's supposed to be this these sort of animus information caches where you're playing as Layla inside the animus finding things inside the animus, these pieces of information, and potentially there could be things that Subject 16, Desmond locked away, it could reveal stuff from the Brotherhood Truth that never got sort of concluded, we know Desmond had a son, things like that, you find Eve, the Keo DNA, is that Layla, we don't know, there's certain threads that were never thought out and never finished, but potentially here could be used to tie back in with this modern day plotline. It's a big stretch prediction I'm making. This isn't something that I'm necessarily set on, but it's something I'm predicting will have a bit more of an impact than maybe we're all expecting and really hoping that happens in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. At number one to me, you've heard me talk about this for months and months and months. It's the most important part of this storyline is the way this story ends. And that is that it will connect to Assassin's Creed 1. That's how Valhalla will end. It's set 300 years before AC1. They're quite close in terms of the years they take place. And I believe that it will connect to AC1 in more ways than one, which is that Eivor will become an assassin, will help transition the Hidden Ones to becoming known as assassins. There will be an ending with Eivor in the Middle East towards where the assassins uh, sort of take a huge impact in, in terms of real history, throughout Syria and Persia. And that's where, of course, Masyaf is, and Alamut Castle, these real historical assassin locations in real history, not just in Assassin's Creed, and of course in 1191 where Altair is in Assassin's Creed 1. I think that transition happens in this game, that's how this game ends. But even in a bigger way, is that I believe by X Apple of Eden, which we know as Altair's Apple of Eden, which was somehow made its way into what looks like the Ark of the Covenant in the first scene in Assassin's Creed 1 in Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. I believe that at the end of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Eivor will have this apple, and somehow we will see it get to Solomon's Temple for some reason. We will see how it gets there. Solomon's Temple will be a part of the ending, that Apple of Eden will be a part of the ending, and that transition, that handoff between Bayek to Altair, the origins of the Assassins, to Assassin's Creed 1, that link will happen through Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Eivor. That will happen. That is my number one prediction, not just in terms of what I want to happen, but what I believe has to happen. Has to happen. Will it happen? Fuck. I don't know. But I'm predicting it will because I believe it has to happen to make this game mean something special and make everything that's come before, from Assassin's Creed 1 that connects to the Ezio trilogy to Desmond, from the Kenway saga with the Grand Temple to the Sages, to the origins of the Assassins with Bayek, moving on to now in Valhalla with Eivor. All these different connecting plot lines need to come together and wrap up with not just the modern day and breaking the code and breaking the node, but also in terms of the origins of the Assassin Order from Bayek to Eivor to Altair in Assassin's Creed 1. It has to happen. Those are my top 10 predictions for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. If you made it all the way through, thank you so much. Be sure to like this video. Subscribe to the channel, get ready. I'm going to be streaming 
all of my playthrough of Valhalla until I platinum the game on the PS5. That's going to happen. So be there. Be ready. I'm excited. There's some concerns, obviously, you all know that. Be sure to continue to tune into this channel. The next, as always, podcast is the Four Pillars getting together to do our preview show for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. The final preview before the game comes out. So just be ready. Stay tuned. Subscribe to the channel. And thank you, of course, to our Patreon producers over patreon.com forward slash as always. Couldn't be here without you, really. I couldn't. I wouldn't. So thank you again for watching. And I'll see you all next time.